didn't go to plan did it <laughs> 2020 thanks for coming good job hasn't exactly been the year i think all of us were hoping for riding bikes and trips and having fun but it's not all been doom and gloom we have got out and we have done a fair bit of motorcycling this year hopefully we've managed to keep you guys entertained throughout in the bits where you've been locked down and yeah not been able to get out and play on your own bikes and fingers crossed we can get a lot more riding done in 2021 but before we draw a line under what has been one of the oddest years for all of us ever in life here's a little look at some of our top picks from the 2020 riding season at bike world pick number one i'm going to start out with pre-lockdown getting out on ktm's 1290 super duke r the world hadn't turned itself upside down motorcycle launches were still a thing and we were in portimao riding ktm's frankly bonkers super naked bike on a perfect sunny track day what's more a lot of manufacturers are quite safety conscious on launches a lot of them like to tell us to take it easy and calm down but ktm have never been like that and this launch was no exception they had us in stitches in the press presentation at the beginning of the launch when they said oh yeah by the way the last session of the day we're not saying it's a wheelie session but we're going to be taking photos of bikes mainly on the back wheel so enjoy yourselves you've got to respect any manufacturer that has the balls to stand in front of a bunch of journalists and say go ahead wheelie the hell out of our bikes i think that little explanation there says everything you need to know about ktm as a company and the super duke as a bike <laughs> Beast 3.0. That's what KTM are calling their new 1290 Super Duke R. And it's down to us to find out whether they're right and whether the name's appropriate. 1290 has a whole new engine. It has a new frame. The wheels have been redesigned. It, it bears the resemblance to the family, but it really has changed a lot. Interestingly, to ride, we'll find out if it's that different. I'm not sure it's gonna be. Now my favorite bit about the KTM attitude to bikes is they, are they still childish and irresponsible? Kind of in a way, you know, the bikes are very well made now that the, the quality has improved massively in the last two decades with KTM. They are still very edgy bikes. You know, they're still bikes built by people who love motorbikes. You know, you talk to this KTM staff and they're all out hammering these things around the mountain passes at every opportunity. At the launch, they're all riding the bikes at the launch. They just can't get enough of riding. I kind of think that shines through in the product. You get a bike that's built by Austrian lunatics, <laughs> four Austrian lunatics, and the rest of us can just hang on and hope for the best. The start of the day kicked off with uh, Project Leader for the Super Duke R. Project Leaders are normally grown up, sensible human beings. This one isn't. Talking us through the safety features on the bike before he led, lent us out for the first ride. His brief basically consisted of, this is how you turn the anti-wheelie control off. This is how you set the performance mode on. Enjoy the ride. <laughs> that was kind of as far as he went. And within literally meters of leaving the hotel, every bike in the group was on the back wheel. And that continued for the entire ride. It was so childish. I defy anyone to give a sensible review of the Super Duke. If anyone starts talking about oh, wind protection and comfort of the seat, they've missed the point. This thing is an idiot. It's a, just an irresponsible, childish mate that lives with you and keeps nudging you again. Go on, go on, I bet you can't. I bet you can't. I bet you can't. And that's what it's like riding it. Every, every road you go on, you come out the corner, you can't help but just go, and up she comes down the next straight into the next corner. And that just goes on and on and on. It is an absolute riot. Third gear, off the corner. Up she comes. <laughs> After the road ride, it was onto the track. And I must confess, with the improvement in the road behavior, I was um, unsure how that would translate onto the track, especially you know, normally if you make a bike better on the road, it's track banners take a bit of a knock. So we came to Portimao Circuit to do some track riding on it. A very technical course, big roller coaster hills, quite a tricky track and a track that will tie a bike in knots if its suspension's lacking in any way. What 
What did surprise me was that you could ride it smoothly and just flow through the turns. At any point in the middle of a turn, you could pick up the gas, just set the rear tire out and let the traction control hang on to it. That way it was so rideable and so predictable was really, really fun on track. Complaints would be maybe a bit vibey. On track when you're tending to rev it a little bit harder down the straights, I did find tingly fingers by the end of the day. We did a lot of riding. That would be my only bugbear with the bike on track. And on the road, I didn't really get that issue. Again, it works better if you ride it in those lower revs. I don't think I've ever been at a racetrack where I've spent the whole day wheeling the length of the start finish straight. Told you the Super Duke was bonkers. <laughs> and when people encourage you, you just have to run with it. I didn't want to be left out. I didn't be, want to be the one sensible person on the launch. So normally I wouldn't like riding like that. <laughs> Best day ever. Video number two has to be my main man, John Hogan. John and I have worked together for over a decade now. He actually took me under his wing when I first became a motorcycle journalist. And uh, we spent a lot of time together in vans and on motorbikes all over the world getting up to incredible shenanigans. Been very lucky. John's incredible shenanigans on this one was the launch of the new Honda Fireblade. John had a fantastic time on the launch about it. And I don't want to spoil the surprise, but if you've seen that video already, you know, <laughs> you know what happened on the launch. And I've not put this in here purely to humiliate John, but he would have done the same to me. <laughs> so check out the most important bit, which is the Honda Fireblade launch. And my favorite bit, which is John's explanation of what happened <laughs> on that launch. I can plot the points of my motorcycle and obsession with the Honda Fireblade. When the 1992 original came out, I was a 12-year-old boy and that thing and other sports bikes of the era were nothing but pages of a magazine to pull out and stick to my bedroom wall. The 2010 model marked another chapter in my life. I joined the Ed team at Superbike and I was gifted one as a long-termer. There's always been a Fireblade at those forks in the road that my personal life have taken along the way. So if we're going to pick a couple of buzzwords that typify Honda Fireblade, they would be dependable, you'd go for reliable and possibly unexcitable, maybe. All that's gone out the window for 2020. This Honda CBR 1000 RRR SP is a whole new ball game. Bang on 1,000cc and it makes 214 horsepower. The way that they've achieved that is typical Honda stuff that I've covered on previous Fireblade launches where I tried to explain the Japanese approach of gathering together a small enough pile of dust to make a mountain. By that I mean they've worked on every single possible area of this motor to extract as much power and performance from it as possible. This is a bike that's been built for racing. So what that means is racers don't really use mid-range, not like we do. Obviously they use it, but they don't use it every day in every gear like we road riders do. So what that results in out on track is a bike that absolutely demands to be revved. It doesn't just need revs to perform, it demands them. If you get caught napping and you're in the mid-range, you're going to get gapped. You're going to get gapped on track days by 600. You've got to scream this thing and where on other fire blades in the past, and even other 1,000cc sports bikes, you kind of get to 11 or 12,000 revs. You think, maybe I'm gonna change gear any second now. Not with this bike, you've got to hang on. You've got to go all the way out. Peak power is 14 and a half thousand revs. It's a flipping screamer of a motor. Let's talk about wheelies. Now, I love wheelies. Everybody loves wheelies, whether they know it or not, and I like to do wheelies all the time. Quite often in the reviews that I do, whether the bike's like it or not, I'll stick one up and then, Try and justify it by saying that it gives me an opportunity to talk about how well a bike fuels, the weight distribution. I did one on this bike at the end of the day. I only did one and it didn't end like all of the other wheelies I've ever done on any track launch or other wheelie, for, for, to be honest. It went really bad. <coughs> I wrote the bike off, I wrote my suit off, I wrote all my kit off um, and crashed the bike on track. So a nice and safe environment. 
Um, entirely my fault. We'd spent all day on super warm Pirelli slicks. Then when we did the camera tracking behind the car, uh, the bike was on road tyres that were cold. I got a little bit carried away with this. It got away from me. So, wheelies, in hindsight, are still very, very good. But they're not always as easy as you think. And the peaky nature of this motor, I'm not trying to make any excuses here, definitely all my fault. The peaky nature of this motor means if you want to pick one up, um, pick it up at about 90 in second. Don't try and pick it up at 40 in first. I turned everything off, so I can't blame any of the systems. And I'm just saying this again, not for legal reasons, but just to hit the point home. It was entirely the fault of the rider. I crashed a wheelie. They won't let us have the footage. I was behind the camera car. I can understand why they won't, but I've seen it and it looks pretty good. So maybe one day Honda will let us have the footage when there's a new Fireblade that comes out, when this becomes an old model. Uh, in PR terms, I think it's bad for Honda. That's why they don't want to let me have it. I appreciate that. I'm very sorry, Honda. And also, if you're ever going to do wheelies for work, don't do them in front of Half Beltram, who runs the Honda BSB team, both Irwin brothers, the entire team of Japanese guys that built this bike, all of your mates from the world's press and the head of PR for Honda UK, all stood on pit wall, all watched me do a wheelie, all watched me destroy a lovely, lovely motorbike. Sorry, sorry, Honda. Video number three was the start of a, a new sector for Bike World and kind of the introduction properly of a new member of the team. I'm talking about when me and Neil took the Royal Enfield Himalayan and the KTM 390 Adventure on a magical mystery tour of the Welsh mountains. Now that video, I got a couple of little extra tidbit secrets for that. So a lot of people asked where a lot of it was filmed. Most of it was filmed on the San Helen, which is a byway that's open certain times of the year throughout the summer, which is just sort of north of Swansea. Beautiful byway and it goes for miles. It's a really popular spot. The little scene we shot in the river over the rocks and boulders, I can't tell you where that was because that was in fact on a bit of private farmland that a friend of mine owns. And that scene where we were in the river and Neil and I did the intro, I think it was a few minutes in the video. If truth be told, we were in that river for three hours and 45 minutes. It took us so long to get through. We had to stop for lunch, <laughs> abandon the bikes in the river, wander back from the van, get some lunch and then try and get them out when we'd uh, had a bit of food because we were starving. So yeah, it doesn't always go as smoothly as it looks in the video. We were stuck in there for, <laughs> for a really long time and uh, Neil was not, not fully complimentary of my choice of route for the day. <laughs> this is Bike World Off-Road. It is as far as you can possibly get from knee down on a V4 Ducati at Bahrain International Circuit. This is dirty, stinky, sweaty, muddy off-road riding. We're going to get stuck, we're going to fall down embankments, we're going to be up to our waist in mud and water, always smiling, and we're going to finish it off on the top of a mountain with a beer at the end of each shoot. And to provide us with a bit of authenticity, I've got my Dakar riding compadre Neil Hawker along for the ride. He thinks it's going to be fun. We'll find out how that turns out. Join us for an absolute blast riding bikes off-road. This is KTM's 390 Adventure, and that is a Royal Enfield Himalayan. This thing is supposed to be the miniature version of the 790 Adventure, which has proved itself time and time again as an incredibly capable off-road adventure bike. That Himalayan was born from years and years and years of Royal Enfields being dragged up the side of the Himalayan mountains. That's the kind of original Indian adventure bike, if you like. Oh, he's making a right meal of that. And what we need to do here, is we need to get through the river, and in the process, make it as hard as possible for Neil to follow me. Fair play. Oh, right, I better get in. I said, be waiting for me. Yes! Yes, I am brilliant! Um, yeah. <laughs> well, I've got wet feet. <laughs> Don't get washed away. <laughs> Are we going up there? We're going to go up that. That might be a two-man lift.
Yes, little KTM! <laughs> and now we're into some properly beautiful trails up in the hills. Awesome riding to be had here. <laughs> and the Hemi's brilliant, it sort of bounces and clatters its way through. <laughs> With a big daft smile on its face and its tongue hanging out the side of its ugly mouth. <laughs> I love it. It's brilliant fun. So Neil's already been through. He nearly drowned. Well, I'm making him stand in the deep puddle and then I'm going to work my way through this left-hand side now. <laughs> Come on, little Himalayan. Wee -hee -hee. Come on, little boat. Yeah! We made it. We have our authentic camp set up. Neil, I, I think we can break the fourth wall a bit here, can't we? Cheers, mate. Cheers. We do a lot of videoing and testing and different shoots with the guys at Bike World. It's awesome fun. I'm going to go out and say today has been the most fun I've had on a shoot for a very long time. Yeah, it was brilliant. We said at the beginning, the very top, the first thing we said, are these bikes fit for adventure? I think yes. Uh, of course, yes. Yeah, bloody hell. Well, yeah, I mean, firstly, it doesn't really matter what you class as an adventure. Each individual has got their own adventure. And whether it's gravel roads, tricky, gnarly climbs and descents and whatever it is, these bikes are capable of a lot. <laughs> a, lot a lot more. Oh, smoky right, eyes. Yeah, yeah I've got smoky eyes. A lot more than they really they were ever designed to do. We took them to some ridiculous places today. We got some funny looks from the boys on the enduro bikes yeah. when they came past us shaking well, their heads. I, I thought it was you, so I sped up. <laughs> I didn't, didn't want to let him pass. It proves the point. You don't need to spend £20,000 on an adventure bike to have fun. We rode both of these bikes as they come from the factory with the road tyres. We took the mirrors off, we took the foot peg rubbers off, and we thrashed them around ridiculous terrain. We've had an absolute blast. Brilliant day. There are four more of these lovely fizzy beverages to go through, <laughs> Neil. I'm going to drink them, then get on the whiskey, and then it'll be warm enough to go to sleep. Thanks, everyone, for watching. We hope you enjoyed our show, and we'll see you on the next one. I think for me, one of the most exciting project bikes that actually got finished this year was the Ducati Desmo Sedici. Dan and John pulled a blinder with that one. I mean, where do you find a Desmo that needs rebuilding? Like, where do you find a Desmo for Christ's sake? What a special bike, what a bit of kit. And to see those guys go through that emotional journey of, oh, it's a Desmo, oh, it's absolutely wrecked. Oh, it's more wrecked than we thought. <laughs> and then finally get it all the way back together and running, working, a proper MotoGP replica for the road. That's super exciting. And yeah, if you've not had a chance to catch up on those episodes, check out what John and Dan went through to, uh, to get a genuine bit of motorcycling history from a damp, horrible basement back to the shiny showroom condition it ought to be. Ta-da! It's a Desmo. So first things first, Dan, what are we gonna do? We're gonna take his clothes off uh, and see what we're working with, really. I don't even think you need to squint to be able to see the bloodline with the bike that Lorenzo and De Vizioso are riding this year, where that comes up and cuts away like that. To so come on in, John, what have you been up to? Well, I genuinely have been busy, mate. Again, in true fat man from Wheeler Dealer style. Yeah, right. I've been doing a little bit of research. Take a look at this. Dan. Just uh, make it look like this, please. There's a good lad. Thanks very much. Cheers. Okay. How you on, mate? All right? Yeah, I'm winning, mate. How's your biscuit? Good? I'm busy up here. Just jump that ears all over. You ready? Yep. <laughs> Uh...
Yeah, as suspected, since we've been messing around doing the valve clearances, I haven't taken anything water side off of the yeah. rear of this cylinder. But as you can clearly see here, there's a puddle of watery coolant. And just in this gap underneath here, oh, yeah, yeah. you can see a big corrosion sign on the head gasket. Yep. So a fairly major discovery towards the end of part five uh, and kind of our loss is the viewer's game. We've added at least another couple of episodes to this now because of the issue with the head gasket. Um, Dan's fairly buoyant because he does this all the time. I feel like it's the end of the world really. I can't imagine there are going to be many places that have got a gasket set for a Desmo <laughs> knocking around. Let's get on the phone. I'm sure we'll find some. You good? Are you sure you're going to be all right putting all those things back where they belong? As long as you don't touch it. What are you trying to say? I've got this. Tell me to bring some celebratory pot noodles. Good there, mate. Uh, what exactly are we celebrating? What's going on? Well, we've finally got some bits for this Desmo now. That's a f***ing pretty big flame, Daniel. <laughs> What's going on there? <laughs> So that concludes our 2020 roundup show. We've got some really exciting things in the pipeline for 2021. We've got an epic new project, which consists of racing, bike builds, traveling around the country, all rolled into one package. We've got more project bikes. We've got more launches. We've got more tests. We've got used bike tests. We've got some really exciting partnerships to launch soon. So 2021 is shaping up to be an awesome year for Bike World and we hope we'll keep you guys as entertained as possible throughout that. Thanks for watching. Have a great new year. In 2021, we're going to kick its ass. It's going to be awesome. Just ride bikes. That's going to make everything better.